again. So Today we are very pleased to have Dr. Hassan Pui joining us from Mount Sinai St. Luke's and Mount Sinai West for a discussion on integrating medical simulation into training and curriculum. Dr. Pui is an associate professor in the Departments of Medicine, Pulmonary, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine. He obtained his medical degree from Damascus University School of Medicine after which he completed a fellowship in critical care medicine at Cooper Hospital University Medical Center, a fellowship in pulmonary medicine at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospitals, and a fellowship in interventional bronchoscopy at Harbor Hospital and the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He also completed a fellowship in clinical quality. Since joining the Division of Pulmonary, Critical Care, and Sleep Medicine at St. Luke's and Roosevelt Hospitals, he has been the director of the intensive care unit at Mount Sinai West and the chief of the critical care section. Dr. Cooley has been involved in clinical and medical education research throughout his academic career. He has been a site principal investigator in several large multi-center trials and authored one of the first randomized control trials showing the impact of simulation-based training on clinical outcomes. Dr. Cooley founded the first simulation laboratory at Roosevelt Hospital with philanthropic support. The simulation lab expanded to a full institution-wide simulation center in 2010 and has since grown exponentially to gain regional and national reputation. Dr. Cooley also established the first simulation fellowship in New York City in 2001. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cooley. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for this wonderful uh, introduction here. And thank you, Dr. Thomas, for the invitation to, uh, to give a talk over here on a topic that is uh, definitely uh, close to my heart and I have been involved in simulation over the past uh, few years as you heard from, uh, you know, from Eric uh, here. I have nothing to, uh, to disclose except my uh, passion to uh, medical education and simulation uh, here that I hope you'll see uh, uh, very uh, visible in, uh, in my talk here. And here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll provide general overview of medical simulation where we are uh, now. Uh, describe the current state of education and research in medical uh, uh, simulation and describe some experiences and challenges uh, <coughs> with creating a uh, simulation uh, curriculum and integrating it uh, into uh, training, share with you some of our experiences and experiences around uh, 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 as well. To start off with, uh, there are a number of definitions for uh, medical simulation and this is one that I feel uh, really represents uh, uh, truly what uh, simulation uh, is. Uh, it's a situation or an environment that is created to allow uh, 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 people to experience a representation of a real event uh, for the purpose uh, of practice, learning, evaluation, testing, or to gain understanding of systems of human uh, actions. And often what you see with simulation is all of the above, really, uh, all uh, bundled into a single uh, uh, scenario with all the interactions between the uh, instructors, the learners, the environment that produce a, a valuable experience uh, 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 through medical simulation. Debriefing is a core uh, uh, element of uh, uh, medical simulation uh, uh, and it's the one that is uh, probably valued the most uh, by uh, the learners uh, as they become more and more mature uh, and more experienced going through uh, medical simulation. And it's defined here again by the Institute of, uh, for Medical Simulation, <coughs> a really r large uh, think tank, if you think of it, uh, in medical simulation that has had a profound impact on the advancement of uh, uh, the medical simulation science and uh, education there. And debriefing is, deep, uh, is uh, uh, defined as a conversation between two or more people, uh, often hopefully more than two uh, people when you talk about team training, to review a uh, real or simulated uh, event in which participants analyze their actions and reflect on the role uh, of thought uh, processes, uh, psychomotor skills, and emotional states uh, to improve or sustain performance in a similar situations. And the key word here is reflect, uh, is to really allow that uh, uh, the learners, uh, as they go through the simulated uh, uh, experience uh, to uh, reflect on what they have really experienced, uh, verbalize, and have a good conversation uh, 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 during that uh, interaction here. Here's a little bit of history for some of us who have been around for some time. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they may recognize some of these land uh, milestones uh, uh, in medical education. The first flight uh, simulator, <clears throat> sorry, you know, was in 1928. Uh, 
uh, and Rissasi Ani, which many of, uh, of us, I know myself, have really learned uh, through in terms of CPR and otherwise in 1960 was introduced. The Harvey Simulator uh, for cardiology in medical schools, uh, we all, many of us, uh, depending on which medical school you went to, uh, have learned uh, through that process too. Uh, uh, in 1975, standardized patients and the OSCE was introduced, and you know, obviously here with the Morshan Center, uh, 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 it's a, uh, a very valuable uh, experience for many of the uh, learners uh, there. And in 1988 was the first full-body simulator, uh, a computerized uh, simulator mannequin uh, that was actually created at uh, uh, at Stanford and has really. Uh, change the way we do simulation and build on that foundation. Uh, there have been a great deal of advancement uh, since then, and depending on really what the specialty is, uh, there are a great deal of uh, changes uh, that have really taken place, uh, and, and our anesthesia colleagues are credited uh, uh, often with the initial uh, advancement that they have made. So when you look at best practices related to medical uh, simulation or simulation-based uh, uh, education, uh, these are really a list of them, you know, feedback, we talked about debriefing and feedback and how valuable it is to the, uh, uh, to the learners, uh, uh, deliberate practice, which is something that can be done uh, through not just really procedural training, but otherwise uh, too, uh, uh, to the point sometime to reach what we call a mastery uh, learning, and there are some uh, uh, studies and data that I can share with you on that. Uh, <clears throat> the ability sometime to transfer to uh, what you learn in the sim uh, environment, uh, a, a lab environment, for example, to the bedside, and this is uh, not fully validated yet, and it's really an area of uh, a great deal of research right now, is that can you uh, transfer what you learn in a lab uh, to the patient, uh, to the bedside uh, there, and there's some good data to suggest you can. It depends on what the scenario and what the venue uh, to. Curriculum integration, and we'll talk more about how our experience with integrating some of the uh, simulation education into uh, curriculum, into uh, uh, our uh, curriculums in medicine and cricket care, for example, uh, to uh, some outcome measurements, uh, team training, extremely valuable venue for uh, simulation uh, uh, education uh, to provide uh, uh, that kind of platform uh, there. Uh, you can really train instructors. Uh, uh, certainly, you know, you can think of it as a standardization uh, sometime of, of what you need to teach uh, people uh, by really going through it in a simulation environment in the sim lab and then uh, uh, do it outside uh, there. So these are just some, uh, uh, maybe a quick list uh, over there. Uh, uh, and obviously the contrast to sim education, to sim environment will be the lecture base, which uh, I hope I'm not putting you to sleep already. Uh, <laughs> through this uh, lecture over here, uh, compared to what you see, for example, in our sim lab over here, a focused, engaged group working with a uh, experienced uh, instructor uh, to learn, for example, uh, medical code uh, training through not just really the basic uh, technical skills, but also teamwork, uh, for example, uh, there. Uh, team training, uh, I just mentioned, you know, do you go through a, uh, uh, a chaotic experience, uh, 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 unrehearsed, uh, versus maybe rehearsing and getting it uh, uh, done uh, well, so you can have really a very uh, a, a more orchestrated, organized uh, teamwork uh, using simulation environment uh, to make people more comfortable. So when they go to real uh, uh, life uh, uh, scenarios, they can be more prepared and more organized in that case there. So how do you use really simulation and for people who are interested in learning theories uh, and the cognitive uh, uh, domains, the uh, uh, pyramid uh, there, some people may use simulation for knowledge acquisition and that's probably an overkill uh, there. There are a lot of other maybe less expensive uh, tools uh, to use to be able uh, uh, to educate uh, uh, people on medical knowledge, especially these days uh, with social media and online uh, uh, maybe opportunities there. Not that you should not be using medical simulation to learn maybe some aspects of uh, medical knowledge there, but I think you get actually more uh, return on investment, if you want to call it, from simulation when you start going into applying that medical uh, knowledge uh, uh, in a simulated uh, environment and learn, learn from it, be able to analyze uh, learners and the environment and the systems uh, around it all the way to evaluate and redirect uh, uh, down the line, this is where you really get a lot of uh, 
uh, return on investment in terms of really using medical uh, simulation uh, to educate here. So where do our uh, ACGME uh, accredited uh, you know, uh, bodies, uh, the uh, uh, residency review committees stand on this? And you know, over a decade ago, there has been a full uh, uh, bulletin actually that was devoted to medical simulation. And when you look at uh, what has been described there, some people may say that this is uh, maybe a bit uh, 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 you know, uh, off mainstream, clinical skills should be learned as far away from the patient as possible. And here they're really talking about maybe the introduction to how you learn that uh, acquisition of uh, initial skills as a learner that maybe you should not be thrown away, uh, thrown into the uh, uh, real environment uh, at that point, but potentially be in a more safe environment and then acquire that, that uh, initial skill set, become more comfortable, and then maybe go to, let's say, insert a central line in a patient, in a real patient, instead of doing it uh, uh, day one uh, on your training, as some of us uh, have done here. Healthcare is one of the few industries and industries that deal with human lives, obviously, that does not conduct routine rehearsals. And this is still true till this time, 12 years uh, later. Uh, familiarity with protocols becomes clear during simulation. Uh, again, talking about maybe some standardization uh, of, of uh, training here. Simulation determines how residents respond to different situations uh, too. And you'll be able to analyze and get a sense of maybe some areas of uh, uh, or opportunities with some learners as they go through the uh, simulation uh, uh, scenarios uh, there and offers a control way to learn system-based uh, practice uh, too. And when we look at the RRC uh, and, and where they stand in terms of requirement, uh, the bar is fairly low as you see there. And this is not because, as you saw from the previous slide, because of not really uh, genuinely, uh, genuine interest and believe that simulation is the appropriate venue for uh, learners. Some of it has to do with resources, with the cost of doing this, and it's not just resources of buying the mannequins, it's an entire program as you'll see, and obviously some of you have experienced that from your own SIM program. Uh, so for internal medicine, the sponsoring institution and practicing sites must provide residents with access to training using simulation. Very broad, very general, non-specific. And, and so goes on, pulmonary critical care fellows must participate in training. You know, so there's that word must that doesn't really define what that simulation uh, experience uh, uh, should be. Anesthesia has tried to quantify this, so they, uh, the RRC uh, says residents must uh, participate in at least one simulated clinical experience each year of their uh, training there. And this is actually being built on and refined, and I think you'll see more uh, uh, requirement uh, uh, mandates uh, sometimes uh, by the uh, ACGME and, and uh, residency review committees. Uh, and there, are a, when you talk about equipment, some people think of simulation, you know, it's all these uh, nice gadgets. Uh, some of them are obviously quite expensive, but it's not really just about that. It's how you utilize these uh, equipment and gadgets, and some of it is really standardized patients uh, uh, too. So what's the state of research? Uh, when you talk about medical uh, simulation. Uh, and it's a relatively young field uh, in the way it is now presented uh, in the main uh, domains. Uh, it's a rapidly expanding body of literature uh, for the past almost 15 plus years, almost two decades uh, now. Uh, there is a journal, uh, Simulation in Healthcare, that has been uh, uh, really now publishing for over a decade uh, and fairly popular, especially for people who are in this area in medical education. International meeting on simulation in healthcare attended usually by 4,000 plus people sometimes uh, there. So it's a lot of uh, interest, uh, a lot of workshops that you see uh, uh, during some of these meetings, this meetings. And this is not, I mean, if you go probably, depending on which society you belong to or which uh, society uh, meeting that you go to uh, uh, annually, often there are simulation workshops uh, around that. Uh, this is really just a, a sim, uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, that is all devoted to uh, simulation from a uh, multi-specialties uh, there. Many articles that you see right now uh, have been seen are based on local experiences, a single site uh, uh, type of articles, not necessarily a multi-center trials, uh, 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 and especially when you talk about randomized uh, trial there, and often the, the focus is on best practices in teaching, learning, and assessment. Uh, 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 in there, linking it to clinical outcome, it's, there's more emerging literature that is going, uh, that is going on uh, right now. And I want to share with you, uh, you know, some of these uh, 
uh, papers that may be uh, articles that may be relevant to uh, uh, to day-to-day -day practice uh, that uh, we experience. So this is a paper <coughs> that was published in CHEST a few years back looking at uh, reducing hydrogenic uh, risk uh, in thoracentesis uh, uh, through inter a simulation-based uh, intervention. And the authors in this study retrospectively determined the rate of pneumothorax in their practice uh, there for about one year, which was about 8.6%. And then they provided a wide range of simulation-based training in uh, thoracentesis, uh, 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 you know, for their trainees, uh, fellows, uh, and, and attending physician and otherwise, and they demonstrated that the, in phase two, that the rate was reduced to 1.1 from 8.6, statistically significant uh, decrease in rate of thoracentesis. And what they noticed as well is that there is a significant increase in the volume of these procedures reflecting possibly a, a more ease, more comfort uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with, you know, with thoracentesis among the, uh, you know, some of them are residents who are uh, performing these uh, procedures there and a stability down the line up to two years in the rate of uh, pneumothorax related to, uh, 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 to such a procedure uh, uh, there. So this is one of the earlier interventions that may be translated into impact on clinical outcome in a single uh, center uh, there. This is from our, one of our uh, sister hospitals in, uh, uh, in Beth Israel in 2004, where they uh, uh, published a paper on using a high fidelity uh, simulation to train people in, uh, 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 in ACLS. Uh, I think many of us obviously take ACLS, and I know many of you probably feel that you take, it's really more of an introductory course. It's not meant to make someone credentialed in running a medical code in, you know, not by, uh, by a long shot uh, uh, there. This has been also our experience. So they took their uh, 50 interns uh, at that time and, and they assessed after they have really obtained their, you know, valuable ACLS uh, certification uh, and they put them through a uh, baseline assessment uh, based on a checklist, uh, an assessment tool, uh, and their performance, uh, as it has been demonstrated even by our group or so, you know, this is really uh, not sufficient. And then going from there, they randomized them to a simulation-based intervention with a uh, deliberate practice on these mannequins uh, related to ACLS and teamwork uh, and leadership uh, role. And they showed that there was a significant improvement in their performance, performance that was uh, translated also to the bedside. They did, they have observations, blinded observations at the bedside and showed a difference between the different groups uh, then. So these are, you know, I wanted to share with you some people who really are maybe some skeptic, skeptics about the role of simulation and can you really transfer it to the, uh, you know, to the bedside in terms of a uh, clinical outcomes there. In central line uh, insertion and, uh, you know, uh, training, there's really a, a great deal of evidence to suggest that this is the standard of care in terms of how we train uh, uh, our learners, our trainees in, in uh, at least the initial training uh, uh, for central line in, and preventing maybe some central line infection. And this is really some uh, papers from our group uh, there where we also took our uh, second and third year residents uh, who were quote unquote certified in inserting a central line and we focus on the sterile technique uh, uh, portion of that central line, developed an assessment tool, validated that tool, uh, uh, did a train, a train the trainer uh, type of uh, validation for the group that were uh, 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 instructors in there. And then we uh, randomized the group into either simulation-based training or a video uh, type of practice. Just refresh your memory uh, before you go into uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting in a central line uh, using uh, 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 what's being proposed and agreed on as standard uh, sterile techniques then. And what we showed in our uh, uh, paper, uh, in our study then, uh, that the group who really went through the simulation-based training did significantly much better than the group who went through just the video, even though both of them were certified uh, on uh, entry into this study. Uh, and then what we did obviously, obviously after that is that we uh, went back and everybody who was trained in this uh, had to go back, uh, who participated in this study, go back and go through simulation-based training and we showed that there is a significant drop in uh, CLAPSI central line uh, infections uh, uh, beef, uh, you know, after that uh, period of uh, simulation intervention. One intervention, part of a number of other things uh, that we do to uh, reduce uh, 
CLAPSI. And think of this, you know, what we looked at it, we established really a program based on that where people talk about empowering nurses at the bedside, for example, to stop a physician or a provider <coughs> who is inserting a central line and we test the hypothesis. Do the nurses really, you know, uh, uh, even are they familiar with all the different processes related to a central line insertion that you can stop someone when, you know, when you think that they're, uh, uh, they're doing something wrong or deviating from standard of care? Uh, and we did practically, we put, you know, we put our nurses, ICU nurses, through the same exercise, uh, uh, assess them initially, and, you know, you're not surprised that the, uh, uh, the competency at the, on, on baseline was, uh, was suboptimal. Uh, but after deliberate practice and training, they achieved actually the same level of competency that the residents uh, were able to do uh, and implement that as part of our uh, program uh, there. Impact on policy, we used to have a policy that many hospitals do. Any central line that is placed in the emergency room, you know, within 24 hours of arriving to the ICU, for example, you take out that central line because a number of these lines, you just really did not trust, uh, you know, how uh, uh, sterile the uh, conditions were, uh, not much of a documentation. So we uh, had all of our emergency medicine uh, uh, colleagues, residents, and otherwise go through uh, uh, simulation-based training, the same standard training that, uh, you know, medical surgical uh, residents, faculty, for example, uh, go through. And then from there, we change our policy where if there's really a documentation that there is no more, uh, you know, that this was done sterilely, then you don't remove that line uh, there. And then we looked at the uh, rate of central line infections for lines placed in the emergency room versus lines that were placed in the medical intensive care units uh, uh, then, and there was no difference. And both of them were fairly, uh, law uh, then and think about the impact on patient safety not subjecting the patient for a second central line potentially a uh, a, a risk uh, uh, related uh, uh, procedure uh, uh, that you can really avoid uh, doing it that way so this is some kind of a program and you know think of it as a really a curriculum uh, for for training uh, among different uh, uh, providers to be able to uh, you know, to decrease the rate of central line infection and standardize the way central lines are being placed uh, uh, across the different uh, uh, ICUs uh, in here. I wanted to share with you this paper too, which is really not about the uh, simulation intervention, but using a simulation environment uh, 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 type of uh, uh, setup to study a, uh, to test a checklist versus a random memory recollection uh, uh, there, and this is a, a surgical crisis a checklist uh, uh, that they took a high fidelity uh, simulation settings or our teams uh, from three different institutions uh, who participated in here. And each group, uh, you know, half the scenario they will go through a checklist in a simulated OR versus relying on their memory. And then they went back and they looked at a primary outcome, which is the failure to adhere to critical processes of care, and there was a significant difference uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the group who went through that simulated uh, checklist uh, 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 review versus relying on your memory uh, uh, in a way and using a simulated environment to be able to test that hypothesis and validate the use of checklists, surgical checklists, in the operating rooms uh, there. So to take you through our experience and how we have been able to integrate uh, medical simulation into uh, training and learning uh, at uh, uh, St. Luke's and West, uh, we established, as you heard from Eric, our uh, first sim lab at uh, West in 2007 as an ICU sim lab with a goal then at that point really to provide training to residents in our Department of Medicine uh, uh, and, and with focus on the ICU and people who work in the ICU to improve training uh, of physicians and nurses, standardize some of it and, and improve uh, uh, patient safety there. And that kind of really uh, grew into what we call right now the Center for Advanced Medical Simulation uh, uh, that uh, a couple years ago obtained a five-year full accreditation uh, status by the Society uh, for uh, Simulation in Healthcare in Teaching and Education. Uh, uh, you know, and it's a lot of work by the group. It's all about teams, you know, as, as we all, uh, and, you know, obviously agree in healthcare, and especially in simulation uh, there, to be able to achieve uh, that status. And at that point was the first uh, uh, sim center that is institution-wide uh, accredited sim center uh, 
uh, in New York uh, uh, City, in Manhattan uh, here, and this is what we have. And, you know, obviously when you look at the scope of uh, equipment, physical space, limited by square footage, but three uh, sim labs, uh, suites that we have, it's fairly good, but it's not really about the, uh, you know, all this equipment that you may see uh, in there, although they're expensive and they can cost each one of them sometime $100,000 or more to be able to uh, build. It's really about, uh, it's about the team. It's about the staff uh, who work in these different uh, uh, labs and, and make it work. Uh, and this is one of our simulation uh, labs. Looks like an ICU room. It could be a resuscitation room. Uh, uh, two all wired and equipped actual medical gas are piped into uh, uh, these different uh, labs in here with a control room, a one-way mirror that the uh, learner, the uh, instructors can be sitting behind uh, uh, in there. And this is really our faculty. It's an institution-wide uh, faculty, although our critical care faculty are really the main core faculty uh, uh, who obviously also run that, uh, that sim center uh, there. Our chief residents uh, in medicine are key really to this uh, you know, to this uh, program uh, here, and they have had a huge impact uh, on the growth and the participation of our medical residents into this, revising the curriculums of, uh, <clears throat> you know, and the scheduling of our residents, for example, to be able to participate on a regular basis uh, uh, in a sim uh, 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 scenarios uh, uh, too, and their partners uh, to many of our faculty on a regular basis every year, actually, two of the uh, chief residents have a sim assignment uh, in medicine that is uh, uh, that they can work closely to be able to really schedule and coordinate uh, uh, and, and enhance the participation of, for example, medical residents, uh, you know, in uh, this. Uh, our faculty, uh, uh, especially from Cricket Care, but really also from across the institution, they have to go through a faculty development related to Cricket Care, to, related to simulation training. So they attend courses. Outside, they obtain certificates. They have to uh, participate in different uh, meetings, uh, uh, you know, workshops uh, uh, as well, and obviously their experience uh, with us uh, too. I went through the same uh, faculty development early on uh, uh, to be able to acquire some of these skills uh, uh, there too. Uh, uh, and these are the people who utilize uh, our simulation uh, program and their you know, wide range, including recently in the last couple of years, uh, becoming part of the uh, Icon School of Medicine at uh, Mount Sinai. Some of the medical school, uh, students actually participate in some of these exercises, like for example, through emergency medicine uh, and otherwise uh, too. Uh, Eric mentioned that we established a fellowship and it's a non-accredited fellowship. There are no accredited fellowships in simulation training. It's a one-year fellowship. Uh, uh, we take people often from uh, emergency medicine after they finish uh, their residency training, sometimes from internal medicine uh, uh, too. We have had three people who have gone through this uh, and they do one year. They do some clinical work, uh, uh, spend quite a bit of time in the sim center to learn how to become a, an instructor. Eventually, if they have a interest of running a sim lab and many of them who already graduated to, you know, went to uh, uh, major uh, medical uh, uh, academic centers, uh, Emory, Thomas Jefferson, uh, to name uh, Columbia here, uh, after they have spent some uh, fellowship uh, time uh, uh, with us uh, uh, too uh, in here, uh, uh, you know, and, and they learn all different skills, how to develop programs like this. This is just really sharing with you maybe some examples related to that central line of what it looks like, and obviously it looks fairly real as it should look, look as you are doing a central line at the uh, bedside. Uh, uh, two. Uh, so what are the core areas of training that we incorporate into some of the uh, uh, curriculums that we have? Uh, team training, extremely important. We use Team Steps uh, tools. Uh, we try to uh, 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 select one tool from Team Steps uh, and make it part of the uh, team training uh, uh, scenarios that we have so people get used to some of that terminology that we use uh, during Team Steps. The challenge obviously is they go to the bedside and it's a you know, it's an intermittent, uh, I would call, uh, interactions uh, using some of these uh, uh, Team Steps tools because they're not, you know, it's not a hospital-wide uh, 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 tools that are being used uh, throughout uh, here. Medical code training, rapid response scenarios, uh, for example, I talked about central line insertion and uh, sterile techniques, not just for central line infection, but for all bedside procedures. These are courses that we have. Uh, Airway training, and we focus a great deal on that. Uh, and I'll you know share with you a couple other uh, uh, 
uh, examples uh, uh, of this uh, to uh, some rare events, things that you're probably not going to experience during your training, you know, malignant hyperthermia for our anesthesia folks uh, 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 and some of our nurses uh, uh, to bronchoscopy training and some live drills, which is one of the challenges if you think about simulation. You bring five residents or attendings or so into one uh, area in the sim lab, that's not how we take care of patients. We take care of patients, there is a nurse, there is a pharmacist, there is a physician, there is maybe a trainee there uh, too, so take maybe the mannequins to the, uh, to the real environment and call a medical code, a rapid response uh, that we have been doing this uh, more consistently and test the system uh, on, on one hand and also be able really to uh, 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 test some of these uh, teamwork uh, uh, communications uh, there uh, too. This is a uh, uh, a list of offering for the CAMS uh, uh, courses that we provide in our SIM center, uh, and some of them are based on curriculums uh, which we have been going into in the past now two to three years, uh, and it's a curriculum for two years or one year or three years uh, that is uh, uh, matched up to, the, uh, to that uh, residency program, for example, curriculum uh, uh, there. Uh, what we also do is obviously you need to get some feedback so you can continue to improve and, uh, and make some adjustments. So we have encounter surveys uh, almost every, after every simulation scenario. Our learners uh, have to uh, complete a, uh, you know, a survey uh, uh, and we use that feedback to make some adjustments to uh, future ones. Uh, some of them are just really about the sim environment, about their experience, their interactions, and some of it is about the scenario itself and what they have learned from that scenario too. And some of these surveys are validated assessment uh, survey tools uh, that we use and they're being administered uh, there. Uh, we go through instructor evaluation tools, so we want our learners to also, as we do right in our medical education, to rate uh, the instructors about uh, uh, you know, how well they're doing uh, and their style uh, of, of uh, teaching uh, too. So these are also tools that we, uh, you know, we use uh, and we administer uh, there. So when you talk about developing a simulation you know, curriculum, you really need to look at the, you know, who are the people who are involved uh, in that. And these are people, we talk about content experts. Uh, these are important. Obviously, I talked about critical care faculty. Not all of them are aware of everything else that goes on uh, in maybe an area of anesthesia or so. So you need the contact expert uh, uh, to be a uh, partner in that uh, curriculum development and, uh, and building uh, uh, we're going through it right now actually with rheumatology, for example, where our faculty in the SIM and our SIM staff uh, teaming up, uh, uh, for example, with Dr. Ali and, and, and other people in rheumatology to build a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a procedural type of uh, curriculum for how to train uh, uh, people, for example, uh, in arthrocentesis or so uh, too. Uh, uh, you need to define your learning objectives and, and what you're really uh, trying to accomplish for every single scenario and also for the entire curriculum. As you find out from many of these uh, sessions, you have to make it relevant, right, to the, uh, uh, to the learners. Otherwise, uh, uh, it becomes a bit boring uh, hanging out there. Uh, and, and often, you know, we do really a short scenario, 10, 15 minutes, uh, and then spend most of the time really talking about debriefing uh, uh, and what went uh, uh, during that experience uh, uh, there and make it as interactive and sometimes hard when you have five people, how you get all of them to be engaged in this uh, there and always evaluate the performance, not just of the learners, but also of the instructors and the performance of, uh, you know, of that sim environment uh, there. So here's an example of what, for example, we have this year as a curriculum uh, uh, in simulation for our medical residents. Uh, uh, for the year 2016-17. They go through a case-based training, and I talked about partnering with our uh, chief residents. Uh, have, so every, you know, they have the six and two uh, uh, system. Uh, so all of our categorical residents, uh, every basically eight weeks, they go through a one SIM case. Uh, so over a period of one year, they go through six cases uh, that they could be, have to manage patients with acute respiratory failure, how to manage patients, uh, you know, with a, uh, a GI bleed. And often it's not about the medical knowledge, as I mentioned. There is a component of a medical knowledge content, but we always put in a team uh, communication as part professionalism, you know, as uh, part of that system-based practice. Recently we went through a uh, alcohol withdrawal case uh, and we had just introduced a new CWA protocol into the hospital. So that was a venue to introduce that CWA protocol and kind of really rehearse it and validate it and make sure that 
all the class of categorical residents, you know, go through uh, this uh, too. A lot of obviously training in medical code training and resuscitation and teamwork, uh, uh, which can even expand beyond learning how to uh, run a code in terms of leadership uh, skills, uh, team communication uh, there. I talked about the central line insertion and otherwise paracentesis was, you know, one of them this past year. So always we add, you know, one or two maybe uh, procedural uh, skill, uh, uh, domain uh, in a one-year uh, 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 curriculum there and uh, senior resident boot camp very popular uh, frankly for us uh, recently where we started about a year ago uh, uh, all the uh, third-year residents uh, who themselves actually asked for you know as they become you know we call them the screeners so they're really the most senior uh, resident in the house and they go through some training coming to the same uh, uh, center they practice they work uh, uh, with the instructors uh, uh, on how to become more, uh, you know, comfortable with this, and really a lot of it is about uh, leadership skills, uh, situational awareness. We blindfold some of these residents and have them go through, uh, you know, running a medical code while you're blindfolded, uh, 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 for example. So it can be quite creative in terms of really being able to uh, drill in uh, some of the aspects of training and build that into a curriculum for the medical residents. And everything we do often is based on an assessment tool, validated tools that we use uh, to test the, like this is a chest tube, uh, one for obviously not for medical residents, but really more for, uh, you know, our fellows, for example, intubation competencies, uh, the same thing uh, uh, to uh, in here, the central line. You know, sepsis is everywhere these days, uh, not just among patients, but among, you know, in terms of everything we do in the ED and otherwise, and we use simulation as a venue to uh, really enhance the training uh, uh, and the familiarity of our residents, for example, uh, with uh, uh, all these processes, regulations that are going on, CMS and Department of Health uh, uh, there. Uh, and this is, for example, a case of a, a sepsis that was built that, again, all the residents have really gone through uh, training uh, there, uh, uh, you know, and, and you set up what your, uh, you know, what your learning objectives related to that, early recognitions, what goes into that, uh, you know, for example, and more importantly than evaluating the residents during that based on the NAS competencies, selecting one of those uh, different competencies and the milestones and see if they have reached that milestone or not and document that specifically related, for example, to this case there. We have been doing a couple of this, uh, uh, you know, over time uh, there. And I wanted to share with you a couple examples related, for example, to our fellows in terms of how we incorporated the simulation into uh, uh, the curriculum for uh, pulmonary and critical care uh, uh, fellows. Uh, uh, with the four components of it, uh, too, that I'll go briefly uh, over it. Uh, with the rationale is simulation-based medical education can improve trainees' competencies, not just in procedural skills, but also things like teamwork, leadership uh, uh, skills, uh, for example, and, and continue over a period of three years during their training uh, to enhance their training. The first component is what we call an accelerated uh, skills course, which is really all the fellows from the Mount Sinai Health uh, System uh, in the first week of July now, we have had it since July 2014, they gather uh, and they go through a uh, one day, uh, at least sometime two days, depending really on the different skill sets that uh, they're learning. Some of it is procedural, some of it is uh, a bit of a teamwork, uh, and it's about standardization of what we want them to learn as a group. Uh, and if you think of it, it has been really a great opportunity for our faculty from across the campuses to get together, the SIM faculty that is, or the faculty that are uh, interested in SIM, uh, uh, and to mingle on day one uh, and, and be able to develop that kind of a relationship that is important among different faculty in, uh, in our division, uh, system division of pulmonary and critical care uh, there. And we shared actually our, uh, you know, uh, our uh, data uh, recently at the ATS uh, uh, meeting with, with a great deal of interest uh, in this uh, here. So I talked about the accelerated uh, skills course. Uh, then we have a procedural training where the fellows actually in and out uh, through their first year, for example, and sometimes the second year, they come in and they practice on EBUS, uh, uh, on some bronchoscopy, uh, on some intubation, uh, working with an instructor uh, 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 in our sim center uh, there. So that's the second component. And the third component is a 
clinical scenarios at least twice a uh, year. Uh, each one of our, these are the nine fellows at St. Luke's and West, and obviously growing to become 17 fellows now within the uh, uh, three sites with BI uh, uh, joining, they go through uh, uh, two cases, uh, two learning teamwork. These are challenging cases, and, and the competencies and the evaluations are uh, set up based on their level of training, you know, first year fellow, second year, or third year uh, fellow there, and then a very innovative, I would call a, a fourth component, which is the, uh, uh, what I call a mini fellowship uh, in simulation, where one of our third year residents will select to, our third year uh, uh, fellows will select to do a six months uh, of fellowship uh, during their elective time, during their third year, and learn at this time, really not to be at the learner side, but now at the instructor side, learn how to set up a simulation uh, scenarios, uh, the art of debriefing, uh, for example. And these are really set up for people who are selected, uh, that they want to make medical education as a significant component of their future uh, uh, career uh, there. So we had uh, our first fellow uh, who graduated this year. Uh, you know, from this, and he had a, uh, he was ideal, he had a, already a master's in education, uh, 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 you know, uh, master's in science, so uh, he did such a great job uh, and learned quite a bit during this six months uh, period of time, uh, uh, too. So these are the four components, uh, what I call them, of a curriculum for our pulmonary and critical care uh, fellows. Uh, the same thing we do for that case, for that uh, third component of the uh, curriculum for our fellows. Uh, we map that case to the NAS milestones and they get evaluated uh, you know, on that uh, two uh, uh, here. So this is a tough case of an OB patient who uh, goes through a major uh, hemorrhagic shock, uh, uh, circulatory shock actually, and a pulmonary embolism, amniotic fluid embolism, and how to manage uh, such patient. Uh, 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 you know, where uh, there is a risk for uh, uh, two lives and also you have a family member that you need to uh, uh, work with and this is the issue about communication professionalism that we uh, include in that uh, case uh, <coughs> there uh, uh, too. So, uh, you know, and this is a component obviously of, uh, uh, you know, of our, uh, uh, of our fourth year, uh, third year, uh, uh, fourth component for the fellowship uh, there. Another area that we have started actually going into is, uh, it's not just about the uh, trainees, you know, I think there's a good data about the uh, impact of simulation or the uh, integration of simulation into uh, uh, residency and fellowships and maybe some of the medical school curriculums uh, too, uh, uh, you know, and, and what you see uh, here is really looking at our critical care faculty, uh, pulmonary critical care faculty who uh, you know, we designed a program for them through the FOJP, uh, a patient safety grant uh, that we obtained, and our site was chosen as the train the trainer site. So from the different hospitals uh, 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 that uh, you'll see uh, uh, over here from Montefiore, from obviously our site, St. Luke's uh, West, BI, Mount Sinai Hospital, Maimonides, and also some guests from NYU all came together and developed that 3D curriculum uh, and the competency uh, checklist and the assessment tools, trained all in our center and then uh, went back uh, to their own institutions uh, and they were mandated to, uh, <clears throat> you know, to go through uh, this for all the faculty, for example, in pulmonary and critical care who work in the ICUs, uh, uh, then for our faculty, uh, including the, uh, from uh, uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, so for us really in the pulmonary and critical care division at a system level, everybody went through this uh, training in five skill sets, you know, back mass ventilation, direct uh, 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 laryngoscopy, video, and uh, uh, indirect, for example, uh, how to intubate using a bronchoscope uh, too, and everybody went through that uh, training. You know, think about it, standardize that training uh, for everybody. So standardize the equipment and being familiar with the equipment that are being uh, used. Uh, and, and we shared our data uh, again in the ATS meeting uh, uh, recently uh, uh, last week uh, or so uh, uh, about our findings. And our findings were actually quite, uh, you know, interesting. What you'll see is, first of all, people really appreciated you administer surveys uh, going through this refreshment, some of these uh, skill sets, uh, they have had very little experience uh, uh, going through it uh, too, so there was an opportunity for them to brush up on some of these skills. It's a long uh, course, uh, uh, so for each faculty to go through it is somewhere between four to six hours uh, to complete, 
and it takes a lot of hours to build these courses uh, uh, to uh, uh, made possible through a uh, patient safety uh, grant uh, uh, for example uh, in there and what we find out what we found out during that is that beyond just you know people are really appreciative of going through such a uh, training and accepting it and it's not just pulmonary critical care it's from anesthesia critical care it's from uh, other disciplines uh, too is uh, there's a you know, wide variation in the time to intubate. Uh, and that could be a metric that may be associated with an adverse outcome. So deliberate practice was able to shorten some of that time uh, and make people feel more comfortable uh, uh, maybe with some aspects of intubation and be able to select potentially some outliers, people who you know, may need to come back uh, for more practice before they can really uh, uh, do intubation uh, <clears throat> you know, at the, uh, uh, at the bedside uh, too. Uh, so it is also an example of how you can use simulation to uh, assess your faculty competency, to standardize, to uh, just really reassess their performance on a uh, defined intervals, time intervals, uh, uh, and build that into uh, that curriculum uh, there. So in summary, to, uh, to conclude, I think, you know, you can use simulation as you uh, saw from uh, my brief, uh, uh, talk over here in a number of ways. Uh, providing the feedback uh, in the form of debriefing is such a valuable tool that simulation uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can really offer uh, there. Provide opportunities for deliberate practice uh, through all the examples that I have uh, uh, mentioned over here that can be quite valuable to the, uh, uh, to the learners and sometime to achieve that mastery uh, uh, level of uh, uh, competency there. Being able to integrate your simulation into a uh, uh, overall curriculum, uh, uh, and I gave you some examples of how we have been able to do that, and some institutions have been able also to do uh, uh, the same uh, there uh, too. Uh, uh, clinical variations in scenario, it's not about just also the uh, procedural skills, it's the teamwork, it's the leadership, uh, you know, for example, uh, there, uh, try to mix it up. Uh, as much as possible so you keep it interesting uh, to, uh, to the learners uh, and our residents and our fellows really appreciate the experiences and it's a popular you know, time for them when they engage through the uh, SIM Center to the point that we started offering in the past few months and we're gonna you know, uh, 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 probably drill it a bit more during this year is we, you know, an open session. <clears throat> That's based on that feedback from our residents is that sometimes, you know, they don't have time or, you know, it's only one case, so they want more. So we have now uh, at least once a week an open session where our, uh, you know, residents can just really show up and there's an instructor with them. Uh, and there are a couple areas that they can practice on, for example, or go through a, uh, uh, maybe a mini uh, uh, case uh, during that period of time uh, too. Uh, uh, and then, you know, always define the outcomes and uh, benchmarks uh, there. So in summary, simulation is a one tool. Uh, uh, it's relatively new, uh, especially when you talk about high fidelity uh, mannequin type of uh, simulation. It is expensive, it is exciting, and I'm certainly biased in this, uh, uh, but I think it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's a fair bias uh, here if there's something like that uh, called. Uh, uh, our educational, uh, in our educational repertoire, which is, you know, this is not about learning everything through simulation. It's really one of these uh, options that we have to continue to train and assess and uh, standardize what we need uh, uh, to do uh, here. Uh, Simulation-based training uh, may provide an alternative or often really a complementary way to train healthcare providers uh, which involve less risk to the patient uh, in a risk-free environment, which is the simulation environment is. It's not always risk-free, as you all know that, you know, we have had some trainees, uh, learners who go through this experience, and it's such an emotional, powerful exp uh, experience for them that you also need to be aware of that uh, and be able really to uh, uh, you know, to uh, obviously uh, uh, manage uh, their emotions as they go through this uh, sensitive uh, experiences in the Sim Center uh, too. The use of simulation techniques in training and evaluating uh, learners is increasingly viewed uh, as an improved methodology for medical instruction uh, and assessment by many medical educators and regulatory oversights. And I think you'll see in the next probably few years more mandates, uh, more requirement. Uh, uh, you know, uh, even though we don't like uh, people to require us to mandate us to do things, uh, optional is the better way to do it uh, <clears throat> in here, but may raise the bar a bit and make people feel that they need to uh, 
uh, to get more involved in terms of medical uh, simulation here. And I think of it really as when you look at simulation as uh, almost the tip of the iceberg. You know, you, first of all, you need to navigate well uh, uh, as you go through all these uh, different uh, uh, pathways there, but also really we're seeing only uh, the beginning uh, here to some extent in terms of medical simulation and what can really offer and enhance uh, our goals and objectives in terms of really train uh, our uh, uh, our learners uh, in a safe environment uh, and achieve the goals that we want to achieve there uh, too. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to uh, speak with you and, and share with you some of our experiences uh, over here and, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. teach one. Right. You didn't get a lot of experience before you were already teaching the procedure. Now, Gladwell wrote a book where he reviewed a lot of uh, data uh, published by others where having a lot of experience doing something repetitively certainly gave you greater skills. So that raises the question, the younger people here grew up manipulating things with their hands as they played games on computers and whatever. You would expect them to have skills that some of us old folks didn't have when they went to do laparoscopic surgery or, or whatever. The other uh, possibility, another possibility, is from your early slides, it's hard to keep the attention of a room full of people and you show them sleeping and doing all kinds of other things uh, as opposed to a small group setting where the student has a great deal of difficulty avoiding paying attention to you. Would you like to uh, tell us what you think about these different uh, aspects? Thank you. Uh, I, I grew up also in the, uh, you know, uh, see one, uh, do one and uh, teach one too. Uh, and that was actually, uh, you know, one of our uh, rationale for doing, uh, you know, that initial study I mentioned about the central line uh, too. Uh, and I think when you, you know, this is one aspect of simulation, which is the procedural technical skills that you can learn. Uh, and I think another aspect of it, I remember, you know, when I was uh, growing up in my training, we had a lot more, uh, I think, uh, chances sometimes to put in certain central lines, for example, to run codes, uh, with all the changes right now about end of life care, we don't run as many codes, uh, uh, we don't put as many central lines, mid lines, and, and uh, picks or so. So here's an environment that can allow you to continue to practice, deliberate practice, uh, regardless of how you, I agree with you, you know, the new generation, if you call them the new generations, uh, uh, who work with all these iPads and all different, uh, and they become intuitive. Uh, to some of these hand-eye coordination skills and they're very comfortable with it. Maybe some of us uh, are not as comfortable uh, with it uh, uh, too. So that also really provides uh, that person, which is what we do in the SIM center, some of it in the central line, for example, it's about, you know, it has to be ultrasound guided uh, central line. <clears throat> so they learn how to practice and how to become more comfortable. So they're not just looking at the, you know, at moving their eyes back and forth, uh, but they develop some of that intuitive skill uh, around the two and add to that what simulation can bring which is really you know the additional value related to teamwork uh, uh, for example and, and leadership skills uh, that you'll be able to rehearse and, and kind of really get a sense of what style of leadership uh, that person does going back to your second comment in a small environment now you have five people who are doing it and going over it versus maybe lecturing someone on how to do it or a hit or miss uh, 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 during that scenario that might bring some variables uh, to you to the bedside that maybe this is not what you're looking for or you don't think that you have tested your uh, learners on it too. Uh, so it's complementary, you know, I, I, I certainly, uh, and, and there will be never 
any time where people think that you can learn the vast majority of what you need to learn through simulation uh, you know, environment. It can complement, uh, it can support, it can sometimes validate some of the things that we, uh, we learn as our healthcare and medical education uh, continue to grow and evolve uh, here. you have a follow-up question? So another one. You showed early on that the anesthesiologists now have to have one simulation per year. Do you think that's enough to do anything? No, I don't think it is. And frankly, man, many places uh, are doing uh, more. I mean, you know, you talk about our... Uh, here even at Mount Sinai Hospital, the anesthesia department are extremely... Uh, involved in simulation and they do many more uh, than one in our institution uh, at in at St. Luke's and West uh, the first week uh, uh, the uh, if you look at the interns uh, uh, who are going uh, the anesthesia residents they spend the full week in the sim center uh, uh, going through all different scenarios uh, uh, and that's probably it depends on the uh, on the year somewhere between four to eight and then they spend about three to four per year uh, down the line there. So one is not enough. It's a minimum. You know, it's I think probably the RRC is more introduced it to say, you, you know, once you start doing it, often people realize the value of it too, and now you do more than one. Uh, but if I mandate you need to do one, then you have to establish resources, a structure, uh, to be able to do that one scenario and then build on that there. If I have to uh, maybe uh, read their minds a bit about where they're coming from, uh, in terms of establishing a minimum with a quantity here. So let's thank Dr. Cohen for his Thank you.